It is now our honor to introduce you to our keynote this morning, Mr. William Federer. He is a nationally known speaker and best-selling author of over 20 books highlighting America's heritage. His America's God and Country Encyclopedia of Quotations has sold over half a million copies. His Faith in History TV program airs daily on DirecTV via TCT Network, and his American Minute radio feature is broadcast on over 100 stations and read by thousands daily. A former U.S. congressional candidate, Bill has appeared on C-SPAN, Fox, SBN, CBN, The Blaze, NPR, Focus on the Family, Salem Radio Network, Bot Radio Network, and American Family Radio. He has been quoted or referenced in USA Today, Human Events, New York Times, Washington Times, Washington Post, WND.com, and Daily Caller. The recipient of two honorary doctorates, Bill serves on the board of Regent University and is a senior fellow at the Center for Christian Statesmanship. Let's give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Thank you. Well, it is great to be with you, and uh, that was unique. I've never had two people introduce me at the same time. Um, I have some stories. They're in a book and a DVD series called Miracles in American History, and I thought I'd share some of those with you today. We'll get through as many as we can, and then I'll tag them on to my next session if we don't get through them all. But let's just jump into history. I do send out a daily history email called American Minute, and you can sign up for it at AmericanMinute.com. Well, let's look at the beginning of the country, and we have the colonies are founded, uh, Canada is French, and the New England colonies and so forth are uh, English and British. So it's called the French and Indian War, and a Great Awakening revival breaks out. In times of crisis, people turn to Christ. And so we have a crisis, and this Great Awakening revival, uh, George Whitfield's preaching to crowds of 30,000 people without a microphone. Imagine that, I'm using a microphone today. And so this revival spreads, and when uh, the French are uh, crossing over uh, the Appalachians, and the British send some uh, ambassadors, one of them being uh, George Washington, to Pittsburgh to tell the French that they need to leave, and the French say no, it breaks out into an ambush. And so you have, in 1755, the British marching toward Pittsburgh, Fort Duquesne, and they're ambushed. And there is around 1,400 troops, 900 of the British are killed. That would be a big deal today if 900 people died in a battle somewhere. And so the um, situation gets worse. Uh, George Washington is carrying orders back and forth. He's 23 years old, and the, uh, every officer on horseback is shot except him. Uh, and the General Braddock, who's the commander of the British forces in America, he's killed. So Washington has to take over the command. Uh, he buries him in the middle of a road because he knows the Indians won't find him there and dig him up. And uh, so Washington returns to Fort Cumberland, writes to his younger brother, John Augustine. He says, as I've heard since my arrival at this place, a circumstantial account of my death and dying speech. I take this early opportunity of contradicting the first and of assuring you I have not as yet composed the latter, his dying speech. He goes on, but by the all-powerful dispensations of providence, I have been protected beyond all human probability or expectation, for I had four bullets through my coat, two horses shot under me, yet escaped unhurt, although death was leveling my companions on every side of me. Uh, that word providence that he used, Webster's 1828 dictionary back then, said it's the care and superintendence which God exercises over his creatures by divine providence is understood God himself. So make that clear. And so Washington uh, later is going through the western Pennsylvania woods and uh, an Indian chief uh, greets them and says... Um, Washington was never born to be killed by a bullet. I had 17 fair fires at him with my rifle, and after all, could not bring him to the ground. So this was a miracle in American history. We wouldn't have a George Washington had it happened for this. Now, the French uh, lose, the British win, and now the British are the most powerful empire on planet Earth. King George was like a globalist. He was like a one-world government guy with him at the top. <laughs> he had all of India, Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong, British Guyana, Barbados, Barbuda, Canada, and the colonies in America. And so 
uh, the revolution breaks out. And there's lots of battles that I have. I just picked out a couple this morning. One is the Battle of Brooklyn Heights. And so Washington is in New York, and the harbor fills up with so many British ships, 400 British ships carrying 32,000 troops. Now, the ships back then were sail ships, and so they had masts. And the thousands of masts filled the harbor. They said it looked like a forest of trees, like the whole harbor filled in. And the Continental Congress, this is just two months before the Declaration of Independence. The Continental Congress unanimously passes a day of fasting and prayer. This is getting serious. We are, after all, picking uh, on the most powerful empire in the world, and we really don't have an army or navy. So Continental Congress says, we earnestly recommend the 17th of May, 1776, to be observed as a day of humiliation, fasting, and prayer, that we with united hearts confess and bewail our manifold sins and transgressions, and by a sincere repentance and amendment of life, appease God's righteous displeasure, and through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, obtain his pardon and forgiveness. So, Washington gets this day of fasting order, and what does he do? He orders his troops. He says the Continental Congress, having ordered Friday the 17th instant of May, 1776, to be observed as a day of fasting, humiliation, and prayer, humbly to supplicate the mercy of Almighty God, that it would please him to pardon all our manifold sins and transgressions. The general uh, commands all officers and soldiers to pay strict obedience to the orders of the Continental Congress, that by their unfeigned and pious observation of their religious duties, they may incline the Lord and giver of victory to prosper our arms. So here we are, we're fighting this major battle and we're praying. And uh, Washington writes to his younger brother, John Augustine Washington, we expect a very bloody summer of it at New York. We are not either in men or arms prepared for it. If our cause is just, as I do most religiously believe it to be, the same providence which has in many instances appeared for us will still go on to afford us its aid. So Washington, right after he gets the Declaration of Independence, reads it to his troops, he appoints chaplains to every regiment. And he says this, the general hopes and trusts that every officer and man will endeavor to live and act as becomes a Christian soldier defending the dearest rights and liberties of our country. Well, what happens? The British find a loyalist. What's that? That's somebody who lives in America, but they're not loyal to America. They're loyal to the enemy. I know it's hard for us to imagine that type of person never existed. So this loyalist shows the British where to land away from the American position. And so if you look at the map, here, you see the blue line are Americans, and they're dug in facing the water, right? That's where all the ships are. They figure that's where they're going to come from. The red line is the redcoats. And way down at the bottom, they land where the Americans can't see them. And then they march in a circle all night long through Jamaica Pass there in New York. And they attack Washington from behind on August 27th. 1776. It is the biggest battle of the entire Revolutionary War, and it's the entire American army. There's no second string. If it's over here, it's over. And so Washington uh, has 3,000 of his men get killed. Boom, right off the bat, 3,000 killed. Only 300 British. It is really lopsided. And so Washington's watching from a distance 400 of the 1st Maryland Regiment and these young men charge six times repeatedly directly into the British lines. All of them get killed. And he's watching from a distance saying, good God, what brave fellows I have lost this day. Well, the sun goes down. And now Washington is trapped. There's 8,000 British troops that have got him from behind and he's pinned up against the water. And it's probably going through everyone's mind that the next day the British will win, Washington will be hung, and America will be another British colony in their global empire like India or Kenya. But instead, Washington gets every boat he can find, and they begin to ferry the troops across the East River to Manhattan Island. Now, where the British ships are in the harbor, 
It's turbulent. It's a nor'easter. There's wind that's blowing. But in the, the East River, it's smooth as glass. And so they begin to ferry the troops across, the cannons across, the horses across. They're doing this all night long in the dark and as quiet as they can. And uh, Washington then begins to see the sun come up. And he had only moved half his army. Now he's really in a predicament because he only has half what he had before that could fight. And they're all standing in line ready to get on the boats. And so his chief of intelligence, Major Ben Talmadge, writes, as the dawn of the next day approached, those of us who remained in the trenches became very anxious for our own safety. And when the dawn appeared, there were several regiments still on duty. At this time, a very dense fog began to rise off the river, and it seemed to settle in a peculiar manner over both encampments. I recollect this peculiar providential occurrence perfectly well, and so very dense was the atmosphere that I could scarcely discern a man at six yards distance. We tarried until the sun had risen, but the fog remained as dense as ever. And so he continues to move his army, all of his supplies. He's on the last boat that leaves. It's around noon. And the fog lifts, the British charge, and no one's there. It was the last chance the British had to capture the entire American army all at one time. And so Washington, this was miraculous because had they been captured, uh, the war would have been over. Uh, Washington writes, the hand of providence has been so conspicuous in the course of the war that he must be worse than an infidel that lacks faith. But it will be time enough for me to turn preacher when my present appointment ceases. So when I'm done being general. And so we got attacks from the outside and attacks from the inside. You know, that's sort of the way the life is. You know, Jesus had the Romans and the Pharisees on one side, and then he had Judas on the inside. So that's sort of life, right? You're, you have the inside, but you have to trust the Lord in all these situations. So there's an inside attack, Benedict Arnold. He was actually more popular than George Washington. Very courageous. He won, helped win the Battle of Saratoga. Well, he is um, bypassed for some promotions, and he is made a, um, a military governor of Philadelphia. And um, while he's in Philadelphia, he meets a Loyalist family, and uh, the young daughter, Peggy Shippen, and they end up uh, getting married. Well, she, her, the dad was a Loyalist. And he was sort of, you know, keeping his head low because the, the British had occupied Philadelphia for a year. And so Benedict Arnold now has this loyalist wife that's telling him, you got passed over for promotions. The Americans don't appreciate you. The British would appreciate you. And she keeps nagging him. And after about a year of nagging him, he decides to give in. And by this time, Washington has appointed him in charge of West Point. And this is the biggest military base in America. And it's on the uh, Hudson River, which goes north and south, splitting not just New York in half, but the whole country in half. Because all the New England colonies are on one side and the Middle Southern colonies are on the other. And so if you control West Point, you control the Hudson, you split the country. And um, so there is the point on the river. Uh, there's Benedict Arnold. And uh, so Benedict Arnold meets with a British spy named John Andre. And I put the picture there at the beginning there. So there's John Andre. And they're next to the Hudson River. Some Americans see a British boat sort of dangling out there. And they say, whew, and they shoot a couple cannons. And the British boat goes back down river. And now John Andre's like, ah, how am I going to get back to my British side? And so Benedict Arnold says, well, why don't you just dress as a civilian and sneak across land? Well, the way it works is if you're, um, if you're dressed in uniform and you're captured, you're a prisoner of war. If you're dressed as a civilian and you're captured, you're a traitor and you could be killed. And anyway, so it was risky for John Andre, but he does it anyway. And so he's dressed as a civilian. He walks uh, across the American line, across the no man's land, and he's one bridge away from making it to the British side. And out of the woods comes some 
soldiers that were dressed as Hessians. Those were the German mercenaries that were hired to help the British. And if, if John Andre would have kept his mouth shut, he could have made it, but he blurts out, it's finally good to see some men on our side. And these soldiers say, what do you mean our side? Well, you're Hessians, you must be working with the British. And they go, we're Americans dressed as Hessians to try to catch people who aren't loyal. And he goes, you know what? I knew that. You can't tell nowadays. And I was just saying that. And he tries to talk his way out of it. And they're like, you know what? We're, we're just going to search you anyway. They search him once. They search him twice. They're about to let him go. And then they have the idea of taking off his boots and they take off one of his boots and sagging in the sock is the map of West Point. You know, like with a big arrow attack here. <laughs> and um, these soldiers say, yeah, you know what? We're, we're just going to take you to our commanding officer. And uh, so here's another picture of there's John Andre. He's got his boot off. They're looking at this map and they're marching him back toward West Point and the rumors go ahead, and Benedict Arnold hears about it, and he flees. And he gets on a ship called the Vulture. That was actually the British ship name. His wife stays there. Guess who was going to have breakfast with him that morning? George Washington. Benedict Arnold timed it so that he was going to betray West Point on the very morning George Washington was going to come to inspect West Point. And so uh, General Nathaniel Green. American, writes, treason of the blackest dye was yesterday discovered. General Arnold, who commanded at West Point, was about to give the American cause a deadly wound, if not fatal, stab. Happily, the treason had been timely discovered to prevent the fatal misfortune. The providential train of circumstances, which led to its discovery, affords the most convincing proof that the liberties of America are the object of divine protection. Ezra Stiles, president of Yale, writes, a providential miracle at the last minute detected the treacherous scheme of traitor Benedict Arnold, which would have delivered the American army, including George Washington himself, into the hands of the enemy. The Continental Congress is so happy, right? They had days of fasting, now it's a day of thanksgiving. And this is um, uh, what they write, the remarkable interposition of his watchful providence in the rescuing the person of our commander-in-chief and army from imminent danger at the moment when treason was ripened for execution. It is therefore recommended a day of public thanksgiving and prayer to confess our unworthiness and to offer fervent supplications to the God of all grace to cause the knowledge of Christianity to spread over all the earth. I, I just think it's sort of interesting. Here they, are, here they are thanking God that George Washington wasn't captured thanking God that West Point, our biggest military base, isn't captured. Oh, yeah, and we want to thank God that the knowledge of Christianity spreads over all the earth. Right? This is 1780. This is, um, now, uh, there's lots of more stories, but in 1854, there's a congressman in our U.S. Congress named James Meacham, and he writes this, Down to the Revolution, every colony did sustain religion in some form. It was deemed peculiarly proper that the religion of liberty should be upheld by a free people. Had the people during the revolution had a suspicion of any attempt to war against Christianity, that revolution would have been strangled in its cradle. Well, what happens? The brilliance of America, the, the, the miracle of America, is we took the power of a king and we separated it into the hands of the people. One of my talks that I'm going to give within the next two days, I go through all the world's history and I show the most common form of government is a king, Pharaoh, Caesar, Kaiser, Sultan, Tsar. As the centuries go on, the kingdoms get bigger because with military advancements, you can kill more people, right? Iron stronger than bronze and stirrups and phalanx and gunpowder. But it's that same fallen nature of Cain, Kill, and Abel. But the king of England had the biggest empire on the planet. It was a top-down form of government. Well, America's founders flipped it and they made it a bottom-up form of government. And so that's what we did. Chief Justice John Jay says, Americans are the first people whom heaven has favored with an opportunity of choosing the forms of government under which they should live. All other constitutions have derived their existence from violence or accidental circumstances. Your lives, your liberty, your property will be at the disposal only 
of your Creator and yourselves. If I were to sum up what makes America great, it's this verse right here, this line, that your life, your liberty, and your property are at the disposal of you and your Creator. You get to decide what you are going to do with your life. It's just you and God. We can hear all the tremendous things that the homeschool graduates are going to do with their life, and we're thrilled. They have the freedom. Guess what? If you're a Christian in Cairo, Egypt, you're called garbage people. Why? Because you have to spend your day digging through garbage to make a living because you can never hold a job higher than a Muslim. If you were born in India, in the lowest caste, right, the, 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 all these different, uh, you're called an untouchable, and you have to spend your day cleaning sewers. And no matter how good a job you do, you can never graduate and become a Brahmin. They're near divinity in the Hindu belief system. They get the, sp the special treatment. If you're a Christian caught in North Korea, you're put in a labor camp the rest of your life. The structure doesn't allow you to do whatever you want with your life. In America, our founders, for all their human failings, they gave us a form of government where we get to be in charge of our lives. And uh, Ronald Reagan put it this way, in this country of ours took place the greatest revolution that has ever taken place in the world's history. Every other revolution simply exchanged one set of rulers for another. Here, for the first time, in all the thousands of years of man's relation to man, the Founding Fathers established the idea that you and I had within ourselves the God-given right and ability to determine our own destiny. Well, these again are stories in the book Miracles in American History. Now France helped us in the revolution. You know what they got in return? Nothing but debt. <laughs> you fight a war, and you don't get anything as, they didn't even get any special trade agreements. And so they had a couple years where the crops failed. And the people in France decided to blame their king, Louis XVI, and the queen, Marie Antoinette. It's got to be their problem. And so they chopped off the heads of the king and queen. But it, the situation did not turn around. So then they decided to chop off the heads of all the royalty. The situation still didn't turn around. Then they chopped off the heads of all the wealthy. They have money, we don't. They must be the problem. Still didn't turn around. Then they chopped off the heads of all the businessmen and farmers. They got food and supplies, we don't, right? And then they chopped off the heads of all the hoarders. You have extra food and we don't have enough. You're selfish. Then they chopped off the heads of all the clergy who are speaking out, right? Uh, and then they chop off the heads of the former revolutionaries. The ones that used to chop off heads but got tired of it, somehow they're to blame. <laughs> 40,000 people had their heads chopped off in Paris, France in their revolution. Gee, it's a little different than ours. And um, the Yale president at the time was Timothy Dwight, and he gives an address during this time, 1798. He says, about the year 1728, Voltaire, so celebrated for his wit and his hatred of Christianity, formed a systematical design to destroy Christianity and to introduce in its stead a general diffusion of irreligion and atheism. He goes on, the principal parts of this system, the compilation of the encyclopedia in which with great art and insidiousness, the doctrines of Christian theology were rendered absurd and ridiculous. The being of God was denied and ridiculed. Possession of property was pronounced robbery. You got stuff, right? Chastity, natural affection were declared to be nothing more than groundless prejudices, right? Whatever, you know, what's, what's marriage? What's being a boy? What's being a girl? It's, it's all just your, you know, opinions, your prejudices. Adultery, assassination, poisoning, and other criminal like, uh, of the like infernal nature were taught as lawful, provided the end was good. It's the Machiavellian. The end justifies the means. And then he goes on, the education of youth, books replete with irrel infidelity, irreligion, immorality, and obscenity. Gee, they wanted to get control of the school textbooks. Huh. To destroy us, therefore, our enemies must first destroy our Sabbath and seduce us from the house of God. So what was going on in France? Well, they chopped off all these heads, and then they decided to close the churches. Uh, religious monuments were destroyed, like uh, the statue of good King George uh, uh, in good King, King Henry in, in France. He's the one who tried to patch up the Protestants and the Catholics. He got assassinated. But they had a statue of him. They pulled the statue down. Um, then uh, they dig up the bones of St. Genevieve, right? Back when Attila the Hun was scourging Europe, 451 AD, this young woman got all of Paris to fast and pray, and Attila skipped sacking Paris. 
So St. Genevieve is considered the patron saint of Paris. Well, during this revolution, they dig up her grave and destroy it. Uh, Robespierre, who was the head of the French Committee on Public Safety, uh, gave a speech on intentionally having the government use terror to force people to give up their faith and embrace this new secular government. Could you imagine the government planning terrorist attacks? And the graves were desecrated, crosses forbidden, no public or private worship was allowed, church education was outlawed, and priests and ministers and those who harbored them were executed on sight. This was the same thing that happened in Mexico in 1917, but that's a whole nother talk. Um, so then there's a rural area called the Vendee. It's way far away from Paris. Well, they don't want to go along with this new secular government, so Paris sends an army to the Vendee and kills 300,000 people, men, women, and children. Uh, Napoleon claimed to be ill, and so he didn't participate in that. Uh, Robespierre puts a prostitute in Notre Dame Cathedral, covers her with a sheet, and said, this is the goddess of reason. Let's worship her. They didn't want, like our Constitution, done in the year of the Lord. So they made 1792 the new year one. They didn't want a seven-day week with a Sabbath rest, because that goes back to the Bible. They came up with a 10-day week, a decade week. Each day had 10 hours. Each hour had 100 minutes. Each minute had 100 seconds. They went through all this effort to have everything divisible by 10. They said 10 was the number of man, 10 fingers and 10 toes. So this, they called it the metric system. Maybe that's why I never really liked the metric system. And um, so during this time, France breaks their treaties with America, captures American ships. Now we're almost on the verge of a war with France. So the biggest power in the world is Britain. The second biggest power in the world is France. We just got done with the war with Britain. Now we're this close to a war with France. Not good. And so our... Uh, we sent some ambassadors over there. <clears throat> Their foreign minister is named Talleyrand. He's such a, a liar. Um, he says, if you bribe me with money under the table, I will stop having the French ships attack the American ships. And so the cry goes across America, millions for defense, not one cent for tribute. We're not going to pay this French guy off. And he, he speaks out every side of his mouth, right? So they got this cartoon of him. So over in America, our president is John Adams, the second president. He decides to have a day of fasting, 1798. John Adams says, as the people of the United States are still held in jeopardy by insidious acts of a foreign nation, as well as by the dissemination among them of those principles subversive to the foundations of all religious, moral, and social obligations. What's he talking about? This French infidelity was coming into the college campuses. And it was becoming the in thing on college campuses to be a French deist and, you know, a Francophile and everything from France must be good. And so they're embracing all this French, you know, uh, irreligion. And so that's what John Adams is talking about, the dissemination of these principles subversive to the foundations of religion and morals. So John Adams goes on. I hereby recommend a day of solemn humiliation, fasting and prayer that the citizens call to mind our numerous offenses against the Most High God, confess them before him with sincerest penitence, implore his pardoning mercy through the great mediator and redeemer for our past transgressions, and through the grace of his Holy Spirit may yield a suitable obedience to his righteous requisitions. So what happens? We have a second Great Awakening revival, sweeps across America, uh, crowds are preaching too out in the woods and so forth, and um, uh, this births a world missionary movement and the abolitionist movement. And, uh, and then I'm, I'm going to wind it up here. So what happens in France? They end up getting a dictator named Napoleon. And uh, his navy is going to invade Britain. It's defeated. Uh, then he decides he's going to invade Russia with a half million men. Comes out six months later with only 50,000. How do you lose that many men in six months? Well, he did it. Russian blizzards, Russians were burning all the fields in front of his army so they didn't have supplies. Well, now that Napoleon's army and um, navy are defeated <clears throat> and he's banished to the island of Elba, the British are freed up. And they say, hmm, what should, where should we send our boats? They said America. And so they sent him to Lake Erie. James Madison is the president. He declares a day of prayer. 
Render thanks, acknowledging past transgressions that might invoke his divine displeasure, seeking his merciful forgiveness. And um, <clears throat> so the very next day after the day of prayer is what? September 10th. And there's 28-year-old Oliver Hazard Perry. And we don't even have a port on Lake Erie. We have to put the boats at Putten Bay, Ohio. In other words, build a boat, drag it across a sandbar to get, even get it out into the lake. And so he meets the British ships. They had just gotten done fighting Napoleon. They have long-range cannons. And they splinter the USS Lawrence to pieces. And Oliver Hazard Perry's cannons can't, can't, excuse me, uh, can't even reach the British. And they expect him to surrender. Instead, he gets on a boat, rows to the, most of his crew are free blacks from Ohio. And they row to the second boat called the Niagara. <clears throat> and now he, the wind has changed the battle formations and he sails his Niagara right across the British line, firing every cannon away like a madman. And uh, boom, 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 boom. Uh, finally, after 15 minutes, the smoke clears. He had disabled the entire British squadron. One American boat, 28-year-old Oliver Azerberry, <clears throat> he tells the men on deck, the prayers of my wife are answered. <laughs> <coughs> He writes to the Secretary of Navy, it has pleased the Almighty to give the arms of the United States a signal victory over their enemies on this lake. The British squadron, consisting of two ships, two brigs, one schooner, one sloop, have this moment surrendered to the force of my command after a sharp conflict. And then James Madison, the president, says, it has pleased the Almighty to bless our arms. On Lake Erie, the squadron under the command of Captain Perry, having met the British squadron of superior force. A sanguinary, which means bloody, conflict ended in the capture of the whole. This was a miracle in American history. Well, the British aren't done yet. Last story, the 4,500 British troops march into Washington, D.C. Our soldiers just ran away. Not even a fight, and the British just walk in. Here they are. And uh, Dolly Madison was in the White House. They were setting the table ready for lunch. And they panic in the city. Everybody's fleeing. She has them take the painting of George Washington, which is the only one that it was actually done with him standing there of his image. And, they, and she rides out of town with it on a carriage. The British ride in, and it's British Admiral George Cockburn. Walks into the White House, sees the table set with the food. He sits down, eats the food, and then sets the place on fire, burns the White House to the ground. And then uh, he goes over to the U.S. Capitol, and he has his soldiers sit in the vacated chairs of our congressmen. And he goes to the podium. He says, who votes to burn the American Capitol? And they all say, I, and they burn our Capitol. And then they set fire to the Treasury and Library of Congress. They attack the Navy Yard, and the Capitol is going up in flames. Well, suddenly dark clouds roll in, and thunder grows to a frightening roar. Lightning begins striking at the British troops. Tornado sends debris, knocks off roofs and chimneys on the British. Even cannons were lifted off the ground and thrown yards away. And the British horses and riders were slapped to the ground by the wind. And the book Washington Weather recorded that this British Admiral George Cockburn exclaimed to a lady, great God, madame, is this the kind of storm to which you are accustomed to in this infernal country? <laughs> to which the lady replied, no, sir, this is a special interposition of providence to drive our enemies from our city. <laughs> the British forces flee, torrential rains come and put out the fires. And the British march back to their ships, Two of their ships were blown ashore and their damaged riggings. So a British historian writes, more British soldiers were killed by this stroke of nature than from all the firearms the American troops had mustered in the feeble defense of their city. So this was a miracle. James Madison said the enemy, by a sudden incursion, has succeeded in invading the capital of the nation during their possession, though for a single day only. They wantonly destroyed public edifices. Independence is now to be maintained with the strength and resources which heaven has blessed. And then he goes on, the two houses of the national legislature express that in the present time of public calamity and war, 
a day may be recommended to be observed by the people of the United States as a day of public humiliation, fasting, and prayer to Almighty God. His blessings on their arms, a speedy restoration of peace, of confessing their sins. Now, one of the things, I've read through all the proclamations of all the presidents, and you keep seeing this, of confessing their sins. Why is that? Well, they understood that God can't bless sin. Now, have you ever played with magnets, and they have them stick together, and then what happens if you turn them? They repel. So imagine there's two magnets. One is God, and the other is you. The God magnet has two sides. One side says, I want to bless you, and the other side says judgment, right? Blessings, cursings, right? And then the you magnet has two sides. One side says repent and believe, and the other, si the other side says doubt and sin. So if you have the repent and believe side facing God's I want to bless you side, the magnets stick together. But if you flip and have doubt and sin, God can't bless doubt. Remember Jesus went to his hometown of Nazareth, said he could do very few miracles because of their unbelief, right? And God can't bless sin. And so uh, if we individually or as a nation insist on keeping doubt and sin, God's magnet flips around the judgment. Why? Because God's a just God. He has to judge the sin. Otherwise, he's giving consent to it. He can put off the judgment, but sooner or later. And so what happens is our founders realize we have to repent. We have to flip around the magnet from the doubt and sin side to repenting. And um, now what happened? After the British are driven out of Washington, D.C., the British go to Baltimore, the third biggest city in America. The rains that were on Washington go over Baltimore and just dump. And since Fort McHenry is an earthen fort, softened up the mud, the British fire 1,800 cannonballs nonstop for 25 hours. But a whole lot of them sink in the mud. They had new cannonballs that exploded in the air, bombs bursting in air. And Francis Scott Key was doing a prisoner exchange and was there watching. And then on the morning of September 14th, he sees the flag still waving. And we're all familiar with the first verse of the Star Spangled Banner, but I think we should start singing the fourth verse at the ball games. And it says this, O oh, thus be it ever, when free men shall stand between their love and home and the war's desolation, blessed with victory and peace, May the heaven-rescued land praise the power that has made and preserved us a nation. Then conquer we must when our cause it is just, and this be our motto, in God is our trust. And the star-spangled banner in triumph shall wave over the land of the free and the home of the brave. And that became the motto, and Lincoln was the one who put it on our coins. Eisenhower, 1957, was the one who put it on our paper currency. In God We Trust was adopted as our national motto in 1931. Anyway, um, these are all stories in the book, Miracles in American History. And I um, don't know, am I out of time for, for this session? Do I have any, uh, who's, who's, who do I turn the, the, the pulpit over to? How am I doing time-wise? You want to hear one more story? Whoever has the hook, you can come and get me. Anyway, now, the War of 1812 is officially over in December of, of 1814, but nobody has a telephone to call New Orleans. <laughs> and so the British were supplying the Indians. This is the, the strategy. The British took over India. How? They would come in, give guns to one side, one kingdom, give guns to another kingdom, stir up ancient animosities till they fought each other. And then in the midst of the bloodshed and confusion, the British would come in and conquer both. It's sort of this Solinsky strategy, right? And so what happened was the British came into America and they were giving guns to Indians, promising them scalps if they scalped Americans. And so you have Fort Mims, Alabama. The Red Stick Creek Indians, and you know the French pronunciation of Red Stick is Baton Rouge, right? And so they are promised money for scalps. And so they go to Fort Mims, Alabama, and they scalp 500 people, men, women, and children. And uh, here's the historical marker. Uh, it says Fort Mims, here in Creek Indian War, 1813-14, took place the most brutal massacre in American history. Indians took the fort with heavy loss, then killed all but 36 of the some 550 in the fort. Creeks had been armed by British at Pensacola, in this phase of the War of 1812. And so, who comes to the rescue but Andrew Jackson. He fights the Battle of Horseshoe Bend. Who are fighting with him? Uh, Davy Crockett and Sam Houston. 
were actually there, and Thomas Hart Benton, who became a senator in Missouri. They were young soldiers. Anyway, then Andrew Jackson is sent to New Orleans. And the British have 10,000 of their crack Marine troops, and they are marching to take Andrew Jackson's Tennessee and Kentucky sharpshooters, along with the French pirate Jean Lafitte. And um, uh, they're coming under a fog. So the British are sneaking up on the Americans in this thick, thick fog. And the Americans have an abandoned canal, and they got their, their wooden little fence up. And the British are almost there when what? The fog suddenly lifts. And the Americans see the British right in front of them. <clears throat> and they let into them. Boom, 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 boom. In just one half hour, 2,000 British are killed. Only eight Americans. This is the most powerful military in the world, the British, that defeated Napoleon. And you have this battle where these ragtag Americans killed 2,000. And um, so this uh, stopped the British. And um, Andrew Jackson later writes, it appears the unerring hand of providence shielded my men from the shower of balls, bombs, and rockets when every ball bomb from our guns carried with him a mission of death. He goes on to write, I was sure of success, for I knew that God would not give me previsions of disaster, but signs of victory. He said, this ditch can never be passed. It cannot be done. Right? That was that abandoned canal. Where did the story come from? The pastor of the church in New Orleans said that Andrew Jackson went in and prayed and afterwards said that he had a prevision of victory. And so Jackson writes to the Secretary of War, Heaven, to be sure, has interposed most wonderfully in our behalf, and I'm filled with gratitude when I look back at what we have escaped. This was a miracle in American history. And now, <clears throat> I guess I'll keep going until somebody tells me to stop, but uh, the British now are the undisputed most powerful nation in the world, and uh, they take over India. Now, India had some religion uh, that worshipped um, uh, you know, idols and so forth, and they bathed in the sewage-filled Ganges River. And there was a disease called cholera, and these Indians would get it, but it was just localized. And so what happened was once the British colonized India and brought in their railroads and steamboats, people with cholera could get back on the railroads and steamboat and go where? Back to Europe. And so this was the disease of the 19th century. Millions of people were killed of cholera, this waterborne disease, all throughout Europe. Millions in Paris, in London, Berlin, uh, Denmark, Spain, China, Japan, all across the world. And it started to come to America. And it came through drinking water. And so we had in New York, um, 1832, uh, Congressman Henry Clay pro proposes a public day of humiliation, fasting, and prayer. And it continues to spread. And 1849, California gold rush people infected with cholera would go on the wagon trains out west. They would pull the wagon train around a water hole, and they didn't have proper sewage treatment, and it would seep into, and this cholera would be there. The next wagon train would come and drink from it, and everybody would die. You know, you ever play that Oregon Trail movie, and they go, oh, somebody died of cholera. And, um, and so then the, um, Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. Her son dies of cholera. And uh, President James K. Polk uh, died. And um, 5,000 died in New York, 5,000 died in St. Louis, 3,500 died in Chicago, and then 3,000 died in... 150,000 Americans died of cholera in 1849. And uh, 8,000 in Cincinnati, Ohio, had to postpone its first state fair. The mayor was John Howard, and he proposed a day of fasting, ordered all the sto stores closed in Dayton, hundreds of people knelt in the streets and prayed, the president is Zachary Taylor, and he proclaims, you get it, a day of fasting, a fearful pestilence which is spreading itself throughout the land. It is fitting that a people whose reliance has ever been in his protection should humble themselves before his throne, and while acknowledging past transgressions, ask a continuance of divine mercy. It is therefore earnestly recommended that the first Friday in August, 1849, be observed throughout the United States as a day of fasting, humiliation, and prayer, the governor of New Jersey says, whereas the president of the United States, in consideration of the prevailing pestilence, has set a day of fasting, 
And whereas I believe that the people of this state, in recognition of the obligations of a Christian nation, publicly to acknowledge their dependence on God, that abstaining from their worldly pursuits, they assemble with humble confession of sin, fervently implore Almighty Ruler to remove the scourge of peace, and, uh, the scourge, uh, to remove from us the scourge and speedily restore to us the inestimable blessings of health. So the, after that, the cholera immediately drops and it goes from uh, the light, high numbers down to ones and zeros. By the end of August 1849, the cholera epidemic ends. So this was a miracle in American history. Did you like that one? Uh, a couple more. I see the sign in the back. So I, do, I have 10 more minutes? Wow, okay. So uh, this is a difficult one, but nevertheless, it's important. So Abraham Lincoln proclaims a day of fasting during the Civil War. He says, um, we have forgotten God. Now, it's important, to, the date. The date is April 30th, 1863. He says, we have forgotten God. We've forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace, multiplied, enriched, and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too proud to pray to the God that made us. It behooves us then to humble ourselves before the offended power, confess our national sins, and to pray for clemency and forgiveness. So what day did he proclaim this to be observed? April 30th. What happened two days later that changed the war? On May 2nd, 1863, the South shoots one of its own best generals, Stonewall Jackson, is surveying the field at the Battle of Chancellorville. The first, he's outnumbered three to one and he's winning. And that's a two-day battle. At the end of the first day, he's looking at the battlefield, comes back at twilight. His own men yell, stop, who goes there? And before he can answer, a volley of shots goes off and he's shot twice in his arm, in his hand, his horses, about 15 guys are killed. And uh, just about every Civil War historian will say, if Stonewall Jackson had been at Gettysburg two months later, the South might have won. <laughs> and so, but you can't explain it because he was a better general. He was undefeated, right? or almost undefeated. And, um, and so this freak accident happened just two days after National Day of Prayer. And all we can see, because he was a godly man, but all we can say is God didn't want the country split and he didn't want slavery to continue. Now we're into World War I. <clears throat> In 1918, the president is Woodrow Wilson. He says, the president, commander-in-chief, enjoins the observance of the Sabbath, the importance for man and beast of the prescribed weekly rest, the sacred rights of Christian soldiers and sailors, a best sentiment for a Christian people, and a due regard for the divine will, demand that Sunday labor in the Army and Navy be reduced to the measure of strict necessity. Okay, um, we're getting down there. So anyway, they, so he declares a day of fasting and uh, gives out New Testaments. The president of the United States Woodrow Wilson giving out New Testaments. He writes the foreword to it. He says, the Bible is the word of life, and I beg that you read it. And then the, the general Pershing writes a foreword to the New Testament. So what? one story. You have um, the uh, Germans pin the Americans down at uh, Decauville rail line of Ch near chatel Chiray, France. And Sergeant Alvin York, he describes the Germans got us. They stopped us dead in our tracks. Their machine guns were up there on the heights overlooking us, well hidden. And they, we couldn't tell for certain where the terrible heavy fire was coming from. Those machine guns were spitting fire, cutting down undergrowth all around me. Now, all of eight of Alvin York's group were killed. And he personally takes out 32 machine guns and killed 28 of the enemy. And he's from the backwoods of Tennessee, Kentucky. <clears throat> and he says that... Um, at first, he would shoot while lying down, and then he found out he could shoot better standing up. And then the Germans would keep their heads down. And as soon as they popped the head up, he would shoot it. Then they wouldn't put their heads up. And so he said he began to make turkey calls. Gobble, gobble, gobble. And the guy lifts his head up, boom, boom. And, he and then he gets charged from behind. And these six guys with their bayonets come, and he doesn't have time to get his rifle, so he has his pistol. He turns, and he says, I shoot them the way you shoot, you, the way you shoot turkey. You shoot the furthest away one first. Because if you shoot the closest one, the others will scatter, and you'll never get them. <clears throat> and so he shoots them. I mean, the, and the guy that's the closest is right there. He shoots, finally, he turns around with his rifle, shoots some more. And then a little white flag comes up. <clears throat> and then the German commander comes down. 
And the German commander says, how many of you are there? <laughs> and it was just him and maybe another guy that crawled out of the woods. And, uh, and so he marches 132 of them down the road and they're not about to run away because they know he can pick them off. And so he gets the Medal of Honor. And he says, some of them officers have been saying that I being a mountain boy and accustomed to the woods, done all these things the right way just by instinct. I hadn't never got much learning from books except the Bible. Maybe my instincts are more natural, but that ain't enough to account for the way I come out alive with all those German soldiers raining death on me. I'm telling you, the hand of God must have been in that fight. Just think of them, 30 machine guns raining fire on me, point blank range from only 25 yards, and them, their rifles, pistols, besides, and the bombs. And then those men charge me with fixed bayonets and I never receiving a scratch and bring in 132 prisoners. I have got only one explanation, that God must have heard my prayers. He comes back to America and he starts a Bible school, <laughs> Sergeant York Bible School. Uh, York Institute, and then they make a movie with Gary Cooper starring uh, Sergeant York. Well, there's lots of more stories I pick up uh, with World War II and then all the way up to Apollo 13, and I'll squeeze those into the beginning of my next session. And I, I think that's it for the time, right? So uh, all this book, all this information is in the book called Miracles in American History. I have a four-volume DVD set, and I'll be down at my table. Thank you so much. God bless. <laughs>